this is the paradox of the hyperreal. By uh, uh, seeking to represent more and more, uh, we can end up representing less and less. Uh, the very act of representation can uh, distance us from the uh, reality it seeks to depict, turning it into uh, a self-referential loop uh, of signs. Welcome to the podcast of The Real. I'm your host, Cody Ryans, and I'm joined by one of the indelible thinkers of the 20th century. Our focus today is on a man who is as much an enigma as the subjects he studied. Let's set the stage. Paris, the city of lights, where our guy starts off by diving deep into German studies at the legendary Sorbonne. Picture this. He's hustling, he's juggling jobs, even teaching German, because that's what you did before you stumbled into your life's work. Fast forward a bit, and here we have Jean Baldriard, influenced by the heavy hitters of structuralism, before going all in on a doctorate under none other than Henry Lefebvre. That's right, the Marxist heavyweight who could talk about alienation like he invented the world. Into the 60s, and our man is in the thick of it, lecturing sociology at Nanterre, Basically the intellectual equivalent of Fenway Park during a Sox-Yankees series, if you're into that sort of thing. And here's where it gets wild. He starts off in the Marx Lane, all about classical sociology, but then the 70s roll around and BAM! He's out here crafting a whole new playbook, talking about how tech and media are rewriting the rules of society. This guy isn't just reporting from the sidelines, he's calling the plays before the team even knows what game they're playing. And that's the primer on Jean Baldriard. So keep it locked here because we're about to unpack a whole lot more. Welcome, Jean. Thank you, Cody, for, for having me. Uh, it's quite an experience to be speaking in this digital realm, yet another simulation. We're glad to have you. Jean, your ideas have been cited, celebrated, and critiqued for decades. For someone new to your work, how would you describe the essence of your philosophy in one sentence? If I were to uh, encapsulate my philosophy in a single sentence, it would be, in our contemporary society, the distinction between reality and its representation has collapsed, giving rise to a hyperreal world where uh, simulations replace and precede the real. But of course, uh, that's merely the tip of the Itzeberg. That's really fascinating, John. Thank you. Can you talk about how the work of Karl Marx influenced your thinking, uh, your writing, and your perception of the world? What were the seminal moments in your studies of Marx that had the most palpable impact on on your later writings? Uh, uh, Marx, yes. Uh, his work provided a crucial foundation for my early thinking. You see, Marx's critique of capitalism and uh, his exploration of commodity fetishism were instrumental in, in shaping my perspective on the relationship between objects and their meanings. Uh, in essence, Marx uh, proposed that under capitalism, uh, commodities acquire a life of their own, uh, separated from their use value and the labor that produced them. It was uh, while engaging deeply uh, with these ideas that I started to perceive an evolution um, or perhaps a mutation in this uh, relationship uh, in the latter half of the 20th century, where Marx was concerned uh, with production and the labor process, I became increasingly interested in consumption. I saw uh, a world where objects were no longer mere commodities but had become signs each loaded with meanings, desires, and ideologies. Sure, almost like a status symbol. The seminal moment to address your question was when I began to understand that the logic of consumption was not just about uh, fulfilling needs, but was, in fact, uh, about a constant play of signs and symbols, a game of status and differentiation. My book, The System of Objects, can be seen as an extended meditation on this very evolution. Uh, but over time, uh, I, 
found myself diverging from the Marxist framework, while Marx saw commodities uh, and their exchange uh, as central to capitalism structure, I began to observe that it was not just the objects themselves, um, but the endless chain of signification they were part of. This chain was shaping our realities, constructing a world of simulations where the sign and the real become indistinguishable. Wow. <laughs> Consumption as a constant play of signs and symbols, as you say. You know, I think we're seeing a lot more of that in today's world. There, there's a great scene in Fight Club in which Tyler Durden, who is the movie's main protagonist and a antagonist, oddly enough, uh, he exclaims, you're not how much money you have in the bank, you're not the car you drive, you're not the contents of your wallet, you're not your fucking khakis, pardon my French. Uh, <laughs> Can you can you expound on this quote a little bit? Like, what do you think about this? What do you think about um, this take um, on consumerism? Um, absolutely. Uh, that line from uh, Fight Club uh, indeed encapsulates much of the discontent of living in a hyper-consumerist society. Uh, Tyler Durden's outcry is a radical rebellion against the identification of self with objects of consumption. In our modern world, um, We've been conditioned to define ourselves uh, not by our authentic being or even our relationships, but by the objects we possess uh, and the signs we align with. Yeah, or the, the brands even. When I mention consumption as a constant play of signs and symbols, um, I'm speaking to the idea that uh, in the postmodern uh, world, objects have uh, transcended uh, their mere functional or use value. Um, Instead, they have become symbols laden with uh, meaning, uh, telling stories about uh, uh, our identities, uh, our, our aspirations, uh, our social standing. A car is no longer just a mode of transportation, uh, but an emblem of status. A phone is not just a communication device, but a symbol of our connectivity, modernity, or even our affiliation with a certain lifestyle. Every act of consumption is, uh, therefore, an act of communication. The, uh, with each purchase, each object we, we surround ourselves with, uh, we're constantly sending messages to others and perhaps more poignantly to ourselves uh, about who we are, uh, who we aspire to be, um, or how we want to be perceived. However, there's a tragic irony here. Um, as we're incessantly engaged in this uh, play of signs and symbols, uh, we risk alienating ourselves uh, from genuine experiences and uh, authentic self-definition. Uh, the simulation becomes more palpable, more real than the actual. Um, and in that sense, Tyler Durden's exasperation is a confrontation with uh, the hollowness of such a simulated identity, urging a return to a raw, um, unmediated sense of self uh, that exists independent of the external symbols of the consumerist world. A tragic irony indeed. Um, alienation was a large part of Marxist teaching, Jean, and to some extent Nietzsche with the alienation of labor. Um, but today I, I want to ask you about Hegel. My, my professor, Professor David Stokes Piercy, he once mused that Hegel gave us a map of the world, but unfortunately you couldn't find your way to the grocery store with it. Uh, what do you have to say about that? Ah, Hegel, uh, a thinker of uh, grand uh, narratives and uh, dialectical processes. Uh, Hegel's philosophy is indeed often uh, uh, perceived as a vast, uh, abstract, and sometimes labyrinthine. Your professor's quip humorously captures uh, a sentiment many share about Hegelian uh, philosophy. It offers uh, a sweeping overview of uh, the movement of ideas, history, and spirit. Uh, but its practical applications or immediate relevancies might seem uh, elusive. In Hegel's dialectical process, uh, the evolution of thought and reality advances through stages of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Um, for him, history and thought are continually in a state of um, becoming, evolving through uh, contradictions and their subsequent resolutions 
Uh, it's an ambitious attempt to comprehend the entirety of human history and consciousness in a unified, systematic manner. I mean, that's an ambitious goal. Uh, when one dwells in the minutia of everyday life, the grand dialectical processes of the Hegelian system may seem remote. This is perhaps where uh, your professor's uh, metaphor finds its resonance. Uh, while Hegel might offer a map to understand the grand movement of the world spirit or the unfolding of absolute idea, that same map might not help navigate the, the immediate pressing concerns uh, of our lived experiences, like finding one's way to the grocery store. You know, for me, while I recognize the significance of Hegel's contributions to philosophy, my concerns have been more rooted in the simulacra and the hyper-realities um, of the uh, postmodern age. Um, in a world dominated by media, technology, and consumption, uh, I'm less invested in the grand uh, dialectical unfolding of history and um, more in understanding the interplay of signs, symbols, um, and, uh, and their subsequent disconnections from tangible reality. Okay, so let's, let's talk about tangible reality. Um, there's the Hegelian motto. He said, uh, the real is the rational, and the rational is the real, often made the object of amusement at an idealist naivete. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on this motto? This uh, has uh, stirred much debate and contemplation. For Hegel, the, the world's development is both a logical and historical process. And uh, this statement encapsulates his commitment to the idea that the world's true structure is rational. It implies that reality in its truest essence, follows the pattern and structure of reason. Conversely, uh, anything that is genuinely rational has reality to it. From my perspective, grounded in the postmodern sensibilities, this motto reveals a profound optimism in the power of reason and the coherence of the world. Uh, it reflects a trust in the world's intelligibility and our capacity to understand it rationally. However, in the realm of simulation and hyper-reality, such, such distinctions between the real and the rational become increasingly blurred. Uh, in our contemporary age, what is deemed real often originates not from some inherent rationality or objective reality, but from models, codes, and simulations. We've transitioned from uh, a world where reality was used to produce its representation to one hmm. where our models and simulations proceed and determine our perception of reality. Um, so while Hegel might argue for the interrelation of the real and the rational, I would suggest that our understanding of the real has been destabilized by the onslaught of simulacra in essence, the hyper-real challenges this neat alignment of the real and the rational. Still, Hegel's motto remains uh, a touchstone in, uh, in philosophical discourse. Um, it speaks to a deep uh, human desire to make sense of the world, to find uh, patterns, coherence, and rationality in the chaos of existence. Even if, as I argue, our contemporary world challenges these notions that till uh, uh, the spirit of Hegel's thought uh, still resonates uh, with many who seek to understand uh, the intricate dance of reason and reality. Sure. Uh, I definitely think you could consider me one of those people who seeks to, to understand that dance and, and struggles with it often. I have one last question about Hegel, and then we can move on. Uh, he also mused on, quote-unquote, the end of history. Uh, he thought that this end of history would arrive when humans achieved uh, the perfect level of self-knowledge and self-mastery, when life was completely rational and completely transparent. Um, what do you think about that, the, the, this notion of the end of history? Uh, how might that act as maybe a starting point from which the concepts in your work could 
be the bridge for some people um, from 20th century philosophy to the works of modern popular culture, like, say, a movie like The Matrix. Hegel's concept of uh, the end of history uh, uh, is a fascinating one. For him, history uh, is a dialectical process through which the world spirit actualizes itself and attains full self-consciousness. This endpoint of history would, in uh, Hegel's eyes, be characterized by freedom, self-awareness, mm. and uh, a sort of recon reconciliation uh, between the individual and the, the rational structures of society. Sure. However, the end of history uh, notion was taken up again at the end uh, of the 20th century, notably by Francis Fukuyama, who uh, suggested that liberal democracy might represent the culmination of uh, political and um, ideological uh, evolution. Uh, but this is uh, a far cry from the profound metaphysical reconciliation Hegel had in mind. Um, in the shadow of my uh, thoughts on hyperreality, the concept of the end of history transforms. Hmm. The saturation of simulacra uh, and, and the proliferation of signs devoid of um, original reference have led us to what I've termed the desert of the real. This is not an endpoint characterized by a perfect self-knowledge, but uh, rather by an erasure of distinctions between reality and representation. The world, as it were, has been replaced by uh, its own simulation. Uh, the Matrix is an emblematic piece of popular culture inspired by my work, doesn't it? Uh, um, the film's premise, where simulated reality overtakes and conceals the actual, uh, is precisely the concern I've raised with our contemporary situation. The Matrix, as a hyper-real construct, stands in for the loss of the real, the precedence of the, uh, of the model over reality. Uh, when Morpheus tells Neo uh, that they've been living in a dream world, it mirrors my assertion that we've lost touch with the real amid the vast sea of simulacra. Uh, though this is uh, an oversimplification. So, uh, while Hegel anticipated an end of history marked by the triumph of rationality and reconciliation, um, our current trajectory they suggests a different kind of endpoint. We're moving towards uh, uh, an uh, uh, ever-deepening immersion in hyperreality where the distinction uh, between the real and the simulated becomes increasingly indiscernible if Hegel's end of history is about the world spirit reaching its full realization my work might suggest that we are at the uh, end of the real where the very essence of reality is obscured and overtaken by its own representation the challenge as posed by works like The Matrix is whether we can uh, uh, or even wish to uh, awaken from this hyper-real dream. Well, maybe this is a loaded question, but just from hearing you say those things, it seems like to me that perhaps you think that the representation of your work in The Matrix um, is perhaps a bit oversimplified. Um, do you care to comment on that? Um, that now I see you're trying to get me to be provocative. Uh, it's uh, intriguing how popular culture can absorb, uh, transform, and uh, sometimes oversimplify uh, complex philosophical ideas for, for mass consumption. I have said before that the matrix is indeed a kind of reduction of my concepts, um, but the truth is that a feature film, especially one designed for a broad audience, uh, cannot possibly capture the nuances and depth of theoretical work. Sure, of course not. Uh, the film does brilliantly visualize the idea of a simulated reality uh, taking precedence over uh, the actual aligning with my thoughts on hyper-reality uh, and the dominance of simulacra, uh, yet it establishes a clear boundary between the real and the simulation. And that's something that you differ on. Once you're out of the matrix, it, you're supposedly in the real world. The, um, my assertion is 
somewhat different that in our contemporary condition, the real and the simulation have become so intertwined that distinguishing between them is increasingly challenging. Um, there isn't necessarily an escape hatch like there is uh, in the movie. The hyperreal is not a, a separate realm, but has overlaid and consumed our sense of the real. All right, let's take a break and we'll be right back. Hey, it's Caitlin from Bowman Jewelers, inviting you to our new location at Diamond Point Plaza on West Oakland Avenue. Bowman Jewelers is this area's diamond engagement headquarters and home of the Diamond Vault. Come check out our tremendous selection on West Oakland Avenue in Johnson City. Go Bucks! And we're back here on the podcast of The Real with none other than Jean Baldriard. Let's get back to the interview. Jean, I want to talk more with you about uh, the Wachowskis' um, really critically acclaimed film, The Matrix. There's a famous scene where Neo pulls out uh, your book, Simulacra and Simulation, um, sort of a nod to your influence on the film, um, and somehow more than that. You know, the book is hollowed out. It's hollowed out to a specific section. Um, there's been a lot of speculation about this. How did you feel when you saw your work being used in such context? Um, and do you think the Wachowskis got it right? Uh, yes, that scene. It was both uh, amusing and surreal to uh, see my work physically embedded within the very hyper-reality it critiques. Uh, such a moment is emblematic of our modern condition, where theory, once used to analyze reality, is now integrated and consumed within the spectacle of media itself. That's a poignant point. This recursiveness is very much in tune with my writings about the endless uh, reflections and refractions of the simulacrum. As for the Wachowskis, I believe they are brilliant filmmakers uh, who managed to craft a, um, a narrative that resonates uh, with many of the anxieties and curiosities of our time. Uh, the use of simulacra and simulation is a nod to the philosophical underpinnings of their story, and I appreciate the gesture. It's also a rather clever uh, meta-reference since the book in the movie is hollowed out and used as a disguise, a simulacrum of my actual text. However, as I mentioned earlier, their interpretation of the ideas does divert from my own uh, in notable ways. The film posits a clear distinction between the matrix and the real world, whereas my contention is that the lines between reality and simulation have become irrevocably blurred. Uh, we no longer have the luxury, as Neo does, to simply wake up from the hyper-real. Uh, that said, I don't believe in right or wrong interpretations in this context. Art and philosophy engage in a continuous dialogue, each reshaping the other. Indeed. The Wachowskis took inspiration and crafted a narrative that speaks to their vision and understanding. Thank you uh, again for your candor, Jean. Um, I want to I want to dive a little bit deeper. So when when we talk about the media, we often discuss uh, its representation or its misrepresentation, for that matter, of reality. In your view, has media become its own hyper real entity? Um, you talked about how the representation has become more real than the actual event or the people that it portrays, but I, you know that, I think that might be hard for some people to grasp. So can you just expound on that a little bit? Can you talk about what you mean um, when you say that the, the hyper-real and the symbols and signs of th those things in consumerism um, have come to mean more than reality itself? 
Um, ah, you touch on the crux of one of my uh, central arguments. Um, indeed, in the hyperreal, uh, the media no longer represents reality. Instead, it replaces it. This is the realm of the simulacrum, where copies have no original, and representation ceases to be about reflecting a prior reality. Consider the news. Once the role of journalism was to report on events, to serve as a mirror to reality. Uh, but in our contemporary era, uh, media often precedes and shapes uh, the event itself. Events are staged for media consumption, and in some cases might not even occur without the media's presence or anticipation. The Gulf War, for instance, I provocatively argued was more of a televised event than a traditional war. Its reality was uh, interwoven with its representation. Similarly, celebrities offer another example. They become hyper-real entities where their media image is more significant and real than their actual selves. We know them primarily not as uh, flesh and blood humans, but as media constructs. And these constructs often have a life of their own, uh, independent of the, of the actual person. Uh, this condition is what I've termed the procession of simulacra. Uh, reality is not just distorted by its representation. Rather, representation becomes the primary mode of existence, and reality conforms to it. The map precedes the territory, so to speak. It's a reversal of causality where the representation generates the real rather than the other way around. Uh, in this hyper-real realm, um, our capacity to distinguish between reality and its representation is eroded. The media doesn't just misrepresent reality. It becomes its own reality. And we, in turn, uh, live within this media-constructed reality, often without even realizing it. Hmm. You know, Jean, there is this uh, famous acclaimed musician uh, of the late 20th and 21st century fame. Um, his name is Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails, and he wrote a song on an album called Hesitation Marks, in which the chorus exclaims, I am just a copy of a copy. Perhaps he's a fan. Uh... Indeed, his work with uh, Nine Inch Nails and his uh, forays into film scoring demonstrate an acute sensitivity to the existential and sociocultural crisis of our age. That line you mentioned, I am just a copy of a copy of a copy, resonates deeply with my theory of the simulacrum. Sure, and how so? It perfectly captures the sense of loss, alienation, and detachment that comes with living in a world of endless replication without origin. Music, like all art forms, is both a reflection of its time and a response to it. Artists like Reznor uh, tap into the undercurrents of the collective psyche, giving voice to the anxieties and discontents of their era. As is true for most rock stars. His work serves as a poignant soundtrack to the postmodern condition, echoing the uncertainties and ambiguities of a world where the real and the simulated are increasingly intertwined. <laughs> it's always intriguing when artistic expressions and philosophical ideas converge, suggesting that these concerns touch something fundamental. I definitely think there's something uh, fundamental in the human experience about it. Yuval Noah Harari writes about this in his book called Sapiens, um, about our need to communicate um, overflowing to such a point that we create art, we make music, we do these different um, sort of performative acts that all trace back to our need to communicate. And, you know, much of our modern discourse revolves around uh, this and also authenticity, especially in media. Uh, so, Jean, using your framework, can anything in our contemporary media landscape be... Do you think it can be genuinely authentic, or is everything a form of simulacra? Um, the quest for authenticity. 
such a pervasive concern in an era defined by its mediation? To engage with this question, we must first clarify what we mean by authentic. Uh, in earlier times, authenticity was a quality grounded in uh, the tangible, the original, and the immediate. Um, however, in a world saturated by signs, symbols, and simulations, this very notion of authenticity becomes suspect in our hyper-real age, hmm. where representation often precedes and determines the real, the authentic becomes entangled with its reproductions. Mm, and that's true more often than not. Consider, for instance, a tourist visiting a reconstructed historical seat. The experience feels authentic, yet everything encountered is a meticulous reproduction. The sensation of the real is derived not from the original, but from the simulacrum that stands in its place. This is the paradox of authenticity in our times. Now, regarding the contemporary media landscape, can anything be genuinely authentic? Yeah, I, I mean, I would argue perhaps not. You know, we live in such a state of distorted reality in the modern age, especially with the effects of social media and influencers and algorithms. It's, it's really almost impossible to distinguish between engagement farming and a true human experience online. And as you've noted, media by its nature, I mean, it's just a system of signs and representations, right? Um, even the most sincere documentary, the rawest piece of journalism, or the most genuine piece of art, uh, once it's captured, it's edited, it's transmitted, it, be it becomes you know, a symbol of itself. It's no longer the immediate real, but a depiction of it. I don't think this means that authenticity isn't entirely unattainable. It just it manifests differently in today's world. Um, it might be better understood as a kind of resonance, um, a consistency or an integrity in relation to the context or its intent. Um, I think while everything in our media landscape is a form of simulacra, as you would say, there's there's pockets of what we would perceive as authenticity that can still emerge, but they do so in a system of, of signs and symbols. Um, and maybe the real challenge is to not find the authentic, but to navigate a world where these distinctions are in flux and and be successful in doing so. And 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 on that note, uh, one of my favorite modern thinkers is uh, a man who discusses this concept quite often. His name is Scott Galloway. He is a professor at the NYU Stern School of Business, and he hosts a couple of podcasts. Uh, one is called Pivot. The other is the Prof G podcast, and in these podcasts, he often discusses something that he calls, quote unquote, the the algebra of happiness. Um, and basically what he means by that is uh, the equation in which we can determine how perception shapes our reality. Jean, how do you see the concept of happiness fitting into a world that is completely dominated by simulations and signs and, um, as you so often discuss, the hyper-real? Um, ah, happiness. A curious and evasive concept, isn't it? Uh, throughout history, various cultures and epochs have defined happiness in myriad ways. From the Greeks eudaimonia, which speaks to a life well-lived and in accordance with virtue, to the modern notion of individual contentment, often equated with pleasure or the fulfillment of desires. Now, Scott Galloway's Algebra of Happiness posits that certain variables, when combined in the right way, lead to a life well-lived, uh, suggesting there's a kind of formula to uh, uh, achieving happiness. This very idea is emblematic of our times, that life's complexities can be reduced, quantified, and managed, that there is an algorithm to happiness. Mm, that's a little bleak, huh? In, in the hyper-real world that I often describe, uh, this pursuit of happiness undergoes a peculiar transformation. Happiness, like everything else, becomes a sign, a symbol, a product to be consumed. 
the media, advertising, and industries of all kinds present images of what happiness should look like, the perfect family, the dream vacation, the ideal body, the ultimate gadget. You are not your fucking khakis. These images, detached from any original referent, form a simulacrum of happiness. Uh, uh, the genuine pursuit of contentment becomes overshadowed by the pursuit of these signs of happiness. And, and this is why we have retail therapy. Uh, this is why we have the dopamine we get from videos on social media of cute dogs and the endorphins we get from pornography. That's why all this stuff is so pervasive in our culture today, huh? Don't, don't you think? Uh... I am. Precisely. The danger lies uh, in mistaking the sign for the thing itself. In a world dominated by the hyperreal, uh, we might chase after the images of happiness without ever engaging with the uh, emotional and existential realities underlying them. If we're not careful, we can find ourselves um, living in a perpetual state of lack, always desiring uh, the next image, the next sign, uh, the next simulation that promises contentment. That's not, yeah. Perception, as Scott Galloway rightly notes, shapes our reality. But in a world of simulations, our perceptions are often shaped by forces beyond our immediate awareness. The challenge then is to discern the genuine from the simulated, to navigate the maze of signs without losing sight of one's own internal compass. That's almost impossible. In this context, perhaps true happiness lies not in the attainment of certain signs or symbols, but in the ability to engage critically and reflectively with the world around us, uh, to recognize the difference between the representation of joy and its lived experience, and to carve out spaces of genuine connection meaning, and contentment amidst the overwhelming tide of simulations. Well, you know, I had a uh, English teacher in high school who was well, my favorite teacher ever. He, he brought about a joy of reading within me, and we all had to keep something that he called um, a true journal. And in the first page of the journal, everyone in the class had to write, quote, the unreflected life is not worth living. And then, of course, that is a quote from Socrates. Um, and I, I would agree with both his and your propositions in regards to critical engagements uh, and the need to drill through the symbols to search for meaning, um, you know, per perhaps as Viktor Frankl did through his accounts of his horrific circumstances of the four Nazi camps and the, le the lessons that he had to teach about spiritual survival um, while suffering in many a sense is unavoidable we can learn to cope we can discuss representation and reality um, as to shift gears a bit as diversity in media becomes a prominent topic how can we drawing from your idea of the hyper real how can we differentiate between a genuine representation and a mere simulation are there specific markers that indicate one over the other, do you think? Uh, genuine representation delves uh, into the depth and complexity of characters and narratives, avoiding one-dimensional portrayals. If a character's sole defining feature is their uh, ethnicity, gender, or any other singular aspect of their identity, it's a red flag. Oh, wow. And uh, anti anti Authentic portrayals take into account uh, the historical, cultural, and social backgrounds of characters, ensuring that uh, their narratives are grounded in a lived reality rather than fabricated from ignorance or convenience. Uh, and who is behind the representation? Uh, are the creators, writers, or producers part of the community they are representing? Uh, uh, while it's not an absolute requirement. Genuine representation often comes from a place of lived experience or, or at the very least, deep engagement 
and research. Sometimes the people being represented are the best judges of authenticity, listening to the feedback and reactions of those who see themselves uh, or don't in a representation can be very telling. How, I, uh, motivation. Yeah, why is the representation being made? Is it a genuine attempt to diversify narratives and voices? Or is it a marketing ploy, a means to appeal to a, a broader uh, audience uh, without genuine commitment? And that on the night, uh, the uh, hyperreal blurs these distinctions uh, as the representations often become detached from their, their original reference and circulate in a self-referential loop. In such a world, uh, vigilance and uh, critical engagement uh, become ever more crucial. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Socrates and his emphasis on reflection, uh, it's this uh, very active, reflective, critical engagement that can pierce through the veneer of simulations to seek out genuine representation. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe this is unrelated, but it almost reminds me of um, of scenes out of American Psycho, right? Like the the postmodernist condition. Brett Easton Ellis, uh, he you know he may have been onto something with both American Psycho and Less Than Zero, and. Obviously, I love film. I love media, and I think Christian Bale really took the narrative of Ellis's book to another level. Um, and through that, you have you you have sort of the snowball effect of a generation of white men that that took the ideology of this film and maybe a misrepresentation of it to heart, uh, for better or worse. Um, what do you what do you think about American Psycho and its commentary on postmodernism? Uh, in the case of American Psycho, the narrative uh, is primarily centered around uh, the uh, homogenized, privileged class uh, of Manhattan's elite. Uh, diversity, in the sense of uh, racial or cultural representation, is not at the forefront. However, uh, the film does serve as a reflection on the uniformity and superficiality of a certain societal class and their empty pursuits. The film's ambiguity concerning uh, Bateman's violent actions encapsulates the postmodern dilemma. What is real? What is simulated? Uh, these distinctions become increasingly blurred in a uh, world steeped in signs and, and symbols devoid of original reference or meaning. The violence, whether imagined or real, becomes almost secondary to the fact that it is the characters where and the uh, relentless quest for the next coveted item or experience. And, um, uh, um, and the film, in its dark and unsettling way, captures uh, the sterility and emptiness of a hyper-consumer society. Uh, the characters' interchangeable identities, um, their obsession with brands and uh, surface aesthetics, and their lack of uh, genuine human connection are all indicative of a world where the simul simulacrum reigns supreme. However, one must be uh, cautious not to reduce American Psycho merely as a didactic piece about postmodernism. Uh, art has its own language, one that sometimes escapes even the most astute theories. Uh, yet the film undoubtedly offers a compelling lens through which um, to view and critique the postmodern condition. Um, uh, yeah. hmm. Okay, so how about uh, beyond American Psycho? Can you talk about your feelings on the uh, the commodification of diversity at large? Broadening our uh, scope beyond just the film. The commodification of diversity uh, is undoubtedly an emergent phenomenon uh, in media and culture. It arises from uh, a superficial uh, approach to diversity and inclusion, wherein uh, diverse faces and voices are included not for genuine representation or systemic change, uh, but as a marketable sign of progressiveness. I, uh, consumers or audiences bear significant responsibility 
their demand shapes the media landscape. Do you think that with the increased demand for um, representation in media, uh, do you believe that there's a risk that this representation uh, could become its own form of simulacra, uh, sort of devoid of its own original context and meaning? The short answer is yes, there is a risk. In fact, it's more than just a risk. It's an observable phenomenon and thing. When the demand for representation becomes a dominant narrative, there is a considerable temptation for media producers, corporations, and even individuals to respond to this demand in the most expedient way possible. The quickest response is often superficial, a change in skin color here, a change in gender there, all without a deep engagement with the complexities of lived experiences. Um, such moves can be celebrated as progressive, and in some ways they are, uh, but uh, without depth, they, they risk turning into mere simulacra. Uh, for instance, uh, when uh, diversity is commodified and packaged for consumption, when it's turned into a brand, a logo, a selling point, uh, it becomes part of the hyper-real. Uh, the representation no longer refers back to the real uh, experiences or struggles of marginalized groups, uh, but instead refers only to other representations, other images. Uh, the original context and meaning become lost. Yes, indeed, the paradox. Uh, this is the paradox of the hyper-real by... Uh, uh, seeking to represent more and more, uh, we can end up representing less and less. Uh, the very act of representation can uh, distance us from the uh, reality it seeks to depict, turning it into uh, a self-referential loop uh, of signs. Kind of like we're doing here. Uh, I like it. Yet it's crucial not to be entirely cynical about the push for representation. Um, while there are instances of it turning into simulacra, genuine representation can and does break through, especially when it comes from places of authenticity and genuine commitment. The challenge uh, for society is to discern between the two, to nurture the authentic while being wary of the simulated. And, uh, yeah, I think that would require structural change at the most base level. And in, in today's world, it's so easy to fall into cynicism and hopelessness about the depravity of media. Uh, you know, surface level diversity and overrepresentation permeates media and especially marketing initiatives. I found this especially true, you know, in my work and in, in the world of higher education, uh, signs and symbols often mask deeper realities. Um, do you believe that the current push for diversity in media might be hiding systemic issues? How can we discern between genuine progress and a sort of superficial veneer? Here's my genuine concern, that the act of representation becomes a mere spectacle, a simulation that in its hyper-real form drowns out the authentic struggles and stories of those it claims to represent. Uh, by prioritizing optics uh, over substance, uh, we risk rendering the, the very essence of the marginalized experience into a caricature. Uh, e, uh, so uh, while I commend uh, the push for representation, I caution against its commodification, uh, institutions, uh, media, um, and even individuals should be uh, wary of turning diversity into uh, a consumable uh, product, a mere trend or badge of honor. Uh, uh, true understanding and change require deep introspection, genuine engagement, uh, and uh, a willingness to confront uncomfortable truths. Mm, sure. Okay, John. So do you think that, in your view, that any media entity or higher education institution or you know, really any... Um, entity could ever truly represent diversity without falling into the trap of commodification? Um, and, and if so, how? Uh, it's a, uh, an intriguing question indeed. Let's dissect this. Uh, the media in its traditional role thrives on um, narratives, symbols, and representations. Its essence is to take 
the vast complexity of reality and package it into consumable pieces for its audience. The very nature of this packaging tends towards simplification, towards commodification. Um, can media truly represent diversity? Uh, the problem lies in the concept of representation itself. Uh, when we ask for representation, we're often asking for a mirror to reflect our own lived experiences. Yet no mirror is perfect. Um, it always distorts, even if slightly. In media, uh, this distortion is often magnified by commercial interests, audience expectations, and the limitations of, of narrative storytelling. Um, however, I don't believe it's entirely bleak. Um, here's a provocateur's blueprint. Embrace the complexity. Rather than token gestures or shallow archetypes, media must embrace stories that showcase the complexity and nuance of uh, diverse experiences. Avoid the temptation to produce a one-size-fits-all narrative for any community. And additionally, instead of a monolithic media entity dictating the narrative, there should be a multiplicity of voices. Um, encourage platforms um, where marginalized individuals can tell their stories, unfiltered and raw. Let there be a cacophony, a delightful chaos of authentic story. Um, it's also important to understand the system itself. Uh, uh, recognize that media doesn't operate in a vacuum. It's intertwined with economic, political, and social systems. A call for genuine representation in media is also a call to challenge these larger systems. And how might we foster critical engagement? As consumers, we must not passively accept what's presented. A robust culture of critique, discussion, and debate can pressure media entities to be more genuine in their representation. Even with the best intentions, complete and accurate representation might remain elusive. Uh, that's the nature of the hyper-real world we inhabit. However, striving for it, being vigilant, and continuously adapting can bring us closer to, to the ideal. Uh, while it's a Herculean task with profound self-awareness and, and, and critical engagement, uh, media entities can move closer to genuine representation. As yet, we must always remain wary, always question, and understand that uh, the hyperreal mesh of simulations is uh, pervasive. Uh, sometimes uh, the act of questioning, the act of doubt, is uh, the most authentic stance one can take. Wow. Uh, Jean, you are a absolutely fascinating individual thank you so much for the time that you spent with us today i have i have one last question for you it's it's the bowman jewelers question visit bowmanjewelers.com and enter our promo code for 10 percent off your next engagement ring uh the bowman jewelers question is regarding your profound impact on how many people um interpret the world around them um Jean, how do you want to be remembered in the annals of philosophy and critical theory in the modern era? Uh, the uh, well, first, it's quite amusing, isn't it? We've ventured deep into the complexities of simulacra and hyperreality, and here we find ourselves grounded again by the very tangible lure of a promo code for jewelry. Uh, it's a reminder of the inescapable system of signs and symbols that govern our world. Um, as for how I'd like to be remembered, philosophy and critical theory, at their best, are not about staking a claim to some eternal truth, but about posing questions, unsettling convictions, uh, and prompting new ways of seeing. Uh, I've always aimed to be a thorn uh, in, in the side of accepted realities, a provocateur urging society to confront its comforting illusions. <laughs> Indeed. Um, Jean, thank you so much for this. Uh, I, have, I have one last, last question, and then we'll let you go. Um, 
And once again, I want to thank you so much for your time. And again, thank you to Bowman Jewelers for sponsoring this segment. Um, in, in a world where the lines are increasingly blurred between the real and the simulated, this podcast being a perfect example of that, um, Jean Baldriard, what advice would you give to the average person living in the 21st century, trying their best to navigate this landscape and find genuine connections and genuine meeting in a world uh, in which symbols and status uh, have sort of taken precedent to our true experiences as humans? Ah, the eternal quest for meaning amidst the smoke and mirrors. Um, I appreciate this question uh, because uh, it cuts to the heart of human experience uh, in the world we've constructed. First, recognize the system you are in. Uh, understand that the bombardment of images, information, and signs is not a mere representation of reality, but often a substitution for it. By realizing this, you're already a step ahead in separating the wheat from the chaff. Second, cultivate a sense of critical engagement. Don't consume passively, question everything, uh, especially that which seems most real or urgent. In an age of information overload, uh, a discerning mind is a rare and valuable asset. Third, invest in the tangible and immediate in a world of digital friendships and, and online personas, uh, prioritize genuine human connections. Spend time with loved ones. Engage in face-to-face -face conversations. Immerse yourself in the physical world and cherish those moments that cannot be replicated or commodified. Um, lastly, uh, remember that uh, while the hyperreal might dominate our environment, it doesn't define our essence. The search for meaning, the yearning for authenticity, and the essence of human experience have always been there, uh, even before the age of simulations. Uh, embrace ambiguity, relish complexity, and understand that genuine meaning often lies not in the th loud and explicit, but in the quiet, implicit uh, moments of existence. Well, I can provide tools and lenses uh, to understand the world. Uh, finding meaning and genuine connections remains a deeply personal endeavor. Seek out those real moments, those genuine connections, and cherish them as the true treasures they are in a sea of simulacra. Okay, thank you, Jean. Uh, okay, that's it for the pod. Thank you to Jean Baldriard. What a fascinating dive into the world of simulations, reality, um and a lot of things in between uh thank you to nephew kyle for producing as always thank you to bowman jewelers for sponsoring today's episode remember if you're thinking of making a statement that's realer than the hyper real head over to bowmanjewelers.com use promo code real for that imaginary discount I want to give a quick shout out to Trent Reznor and Nine Inch Nails for providing the soundtrack to my late night musings. And after these philosophical pods, if you haven't given copy of A a listen after our discussion today, well, you're missing out. So stay tuned for the next episode where we're diving into the world of sports analytics and how data is changing the way we consume and understand the games we love. And as always, whether you're navigating the layers of the Matrix or just trying to decide between two fantasy football players, remember to question the narratives, seek out the real, and most importantly, enjoy the journey. That's it for the podcast of The Real. We'll see you next time. Until then, take care! Take care!